So we talked a little bit about uh, the mouth mirror and the functions of the mouth mirror for illumination, transillumination, retraction, those type of things, and ergonomics last week as far as how important it is on how to sit, that your shoulders are parallel to the floor, that your feet are flat on the floor, that you're not twisting your back, those type of things. Um, are there PowerPoints? Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Yes. I can see your screen, but I'm looking to download the PowerPoints for the model. Okay, I might need to post them, <laughs> Michaela. So I will do post modules five and six. Okay, thank you. So this goes right through the Gehrig text. So if you've got your Gehrig text out, you can just kind of flip through that because it's, it's word for word here. So we're going to talk about fulcrums and an intraoral fulcrum is intra inside the mouth. Oral. Misty, mm -hmm. could I interrupt you? I'm so sorry. Just try, I'm trying to write everything down correctly in this syllabus. So the Gehrig modules we need to have read by this coming up clinical on Monday are five through 12. Yes, that's for clinic, not for the test. Right, for the clinic. Okay, on Monday. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure. And then the- Okay. And, okay. Um, and you don't need to have them committed to memory, Kathy. Just be familiar with it because when you're sitting with your patient, uh, your partner, or you're sitting with Dexter, a mannequin, and you're trying to figure out how to place your hands and where to sit, your Garrett textbook will guide you through that. So you need to be familiar enough with the textbook on where to find it. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's, it's a very good book for uh, figuring out what's going on. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I have another question. So it says we have the skill evaluation of the oral inspection. Oh heck, we haven't even gone over that yet. It says that's on Monday, so is that, should we, so that's no or yes? Oh, no, 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 because we haven't even demonstrated it. Okay, so I, okay. So um, I don't know what we're doing on Monday. We've finished medical history, so we're gonna have to do patient operator positioning and, um, and mouth mirror like and the light and that type of thing, and then we'll vitals. demonstrate uh, oral inspection and probably the probe, because we, we, we don't have blood pressures to, to skilly thou on and this it's just a hot mess my friends okay it's a hot mess so we're i'm going to have arrows all over the place we're going to do this here and that there and ugh. no skilly valves on monday you'll probably have a patient operator positioning jennifer on monday and uh air water syringe and mouth mirror on monday but not a skilly valve on those. We will go yeah, over. Yeah, you, you'll have a skilly valve on those. Oh, we will have it. Okay. All right. Thanks. And then you'll be able to practice uh, blood pressure and EOIO. Can you repeat one more time what the skilly valves were for Monday? Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be patient operator positioning mouth mirror, light and air. Thank you. Those are two, two different skilly valves. And we do them kind of at the same time because you're doing them both at the same, they coincide with each other. Yeah, we're gonna have a lot of catch up to do once we get your kits. So uh, part of the ergonomics is, is where do you sit, where do you place your hands and that type of thing. So uh, you need to be aware of good ergonomics so you don't get injured. And if a clinician's large motor skills such as position are not correct, everything else falls apart. So that's why we start out with me, my patient. I mean, we're, we're looking at the big things before we zero in on the little things. Is your patient in a supine position for maxillary? Is your patient in a semi-supine for mandibular? So successful instrumentation requires that you have an eye for detail. And that makes an excellent dental hygienist. So each skill must be performed in a step-by-step -step manner, one skill at a time. So let's talk about what a fulcrum is. Okay, a fulcrum is a finger rest 
used to stabilize the hand during instrumentation. Fulcrums help improve precision of instrumentation strokes and prevent sudden movements that could injure the patient. So you want to look at the fulcrum as a support beam for your hand. Your fulcrum is your ring finger of your of your uh, dominant hand. So if you're a right-handed, it's your ring finger of your right hand. If you're a lefty, it's your ring finger of that hand, of your left hand. So it's a support beam. Think about the patient's mouth. Their jaw is moving. It's going up, it's going down, it's going sideways. They're trying to talk with your hands in their mouth and uh, you need to really have control over those sharp instruments that you're using. So we use intraoral fulcrums. We're going to teach you that. And then next year at this time on Thursday, the second year students are learning extra oral fulcrums to give them even more flexibility as well as advanced fulcruming. But the intraoral fulcrum is just what it says. It's stabilization of your dominant hand by placing the pad of your ring finger on a tooth near the tooth that's being instrumented versus an extraoral fulcrum is stabilization of a non-dominant hand outside the mouth, usually the chin or the cheek. Now an extraoral fulcrum, excuse me, this is saying stabilization of the non-dominant hand, but you can use an extraoral fulcrum in advanced instrumentation with uh, your dominant hand. And then there's advanced fulcrum, which gives you more flexibility to gain access to, uh, excuse me, hard to reach areas. So, intraoral fulcrum, intraoral finger, re finger rest. This is the ring finger here, the middle finger, index finger, and thumb forming what we call a soft soft C. This is what we call the modified pen grasp. All the fingers are touching together. There's no separation. So you assure the relationship of the patient to the clinician. You assume the correct clock position for the area you're working in. Excuse me. This is on the test, this, this part. You establish the head position, chin up for maxillary arch, chin down for mandibular arch, turn towards me, turn away from me, look straight ahead. You adjust your light and all of your equipment needs to be around you, within reach. Um, Misty, I have a question. So yes, yes. You mentioned that the, that part is going to be on the exam, but this chapter is not on the exam for next week? No, but this was, if you uh, remember last week, uh, if you go through modules one, two, three, and four. Yes. Uh -huh. Some of this is a repeat from that. Oh, okay. Okay. okay Thank so, you. Okay, so you want to check yourself at all times. Okay, then you've got your patient and you've got yourself in proper positioning. Then you grasp your mirror and establish a finger rest because we want everything to be relaxed. You're not just holding the mirror in air. You're always resting on hard tissue, preferably on the same arch in the same quadrant that you're working on. Again, Take a look at this grass. It's the soft C, okay? And it's a modified pen grasp. My dominant hand, grasp the instrument. You pause to evaluate the grasp. Take a look at this picture. You are, I want you to memorize in your head what these pictures look like so when you are looking at your hand when you're trying to access something, you can tell, does it look like this picture or not? Because this is proper picture. You've got your thumb and forefinger separated a little bit. You've got your soft C. 
you've got your fulcrum finger extended, that's your ring finger, and all of your fingers are touching. These four fingers are touching. So what I was doing when I was a student, every time I had my pencil or pen in my hand, I was practicing my modified pen grasp. I was fulcruming on the desk and I was rocking and rolling and weaving and bobbing and just doing everything, trying to make that as muscle memory as possible. Because you're not using your fingers, you're using your fulcrum. So what I mean by that, I'm gonna turn my video on, sorry guys. So when we're doing this, I'm not using my fingers. I'm using my whole hand, rocking and rolling. Okay. Everything's working as a unit. This is everything's falling apart. Okay. Soft C, where is it? Soft C, fingers are separated, thumb and forefinger are separated. Everything else is, um, is touching and I'm using this. So play with yourself with this, okay, to get this to be your comfort zone. You're not using your fingers, you're using everything as a unit. This is especially important when you are trying to remove calculus and you need strength behind you. You can do a lot of injury to yourself if you're using your fingers. So, do a freeze frame every now and then and do a self-check. Fingertip on a secure tooth surface. The ring finger is straight, acting like a support beam. Is the finger placement in the grasp still correct? Because a lot of times when you reach what you think you're trying to reach, you fall apart. So this is the sequence. And uh, this will be reviewed for you again on your board reviews. The sequence of establishing a finger rest, me, my patient, my equipment, my non-dominant hand, because that's the mirror is going to be placed in your non-dominant hand and your other instrument is going to be placed in your dominant hand, my finger rest, and then your self-check. So when we're talking about the anterior area, and we're going to be talking about working in the anterior, the front of the mouth first, because it's easiest to work there. You don't have to reach anywhere. But the mouth is divided into surfaces towards you and surfaces away from you, depending on if you're sitting on the patient's right or the patient's left. So for the intraoral fulcrum, you're establishing in your dominant hand, okay? The pad of the ring finger is on the tooth near that tooth being instrumented. This is the fulcrum. Your extra oral fulcrum is here for the mirror. We don't like that. But this is a classic neutral position modified pen grasp. This is what you should look like when you're holding an instrument. Your wrist positions. We went over this last week a little bit. You want to avoid bending the wrist or the hand downward or making sharp angles with it. Neutral position, keeping it straight, not bending. So you can see that this is a mandibular uh, fulcrum. The patient has their chin down, okay? Versus if she was working on the maxillary arch, the chin would be up. Handle in a modified pen grasp for both the mirror and the instrument. Fulcrum finger straight, works as a support beam side pad of the middle finger here. Side pad of the middle finger with some separation between. 
And this says in red, never rest directly above the tooth surface being worked on. Because if you had a sharp bladed instrument here and your fulcrum finger was here, if you slipped, you could end up cutting yourself. So we want this to be, we want the fulcrum out of the line of fire, usually one or two teeth away. Anterior. If you're working on the lingual here, look at where the fulcrum is. It's more on the buckle. And if you were working on the buckle, your fulcrum would be more on the lingual because you have to have room for that instrument. And we're going to go over all of this in, um, in clinic, and then it'll make a little more sense for you. Palm down for the mandibular arch. Palm up for the maxillary arch. That green shaded area shows you where that whole instrument, that handle of the instrument can go, depending on what you need to do. That's all accepted space. So let's talk a little bit about surfaces towards and surfaces away. We're talking about uh, right now the right-handed clinician and you are sitting on the patient's right side to their right and surfaces towards and surfaces away. There's the surfaces towards you, which are the orange on this particular picture and the surfaces away are the surfaces that are the pink towards you or away from you. And this is seating, okay? So if you're seat doing here and you're sitting on this side of the patient and you're doing the surfaces towards you, the gold, you're sitting in the eight or nine o'clock position. And I'm a nine o'clock girl, because that's how I learned. I never sat in the eight o'clock in my life. So you're here at the nine or the eight o'clock for services towards you. For services away from you, you're swinging around and sitting at the 11 to one o'clock position. We only had nine and 12 when I was in school. Those were the only two clock positions, but you've got a little bit of wiggle room. For the left-handed, it's the same thing, just on the other side. So if you see test questions, Hopefully I have done this so I will say the right-handed this and the left-handed that. You'll have both right and left options. So if you're a lefty, you won't be left out. Ha <laughs> get it? Um, but there are pictures like this on your test, okay, of some sort of shading, okay? Where are you sitting? Sequence for finger rest, me, my patient my equipment, my non-dominant hand, my dominant hand, and my finger rest, and then you selfie fell. So that's the sequence. Okay, then these are modified um, or advanced fulcrumine, which we are, aren't going to harp on, but you can see that um, this finger here, this index finger, is resting on this fulcrum finger here. So this is more advanced fulcrumine. Uh, we will get into this this time next year. So let's take a look at this uh, clinician. What's going on with her? Her torso, her back. Posture. She's hunched over. Hunched her over. Her feet are not on the floor. Feet are not on the floor. And I would venture to say too that her breasts are probably laying on this patient's forehead. <laughs> it's something we need to be aware of <laughs> because it can make people uncomfortable. And we're wearing lab coat and then we're wearing, uh, sometimes we're wearing a disposable jacket on top of there. And we're not, and we're trying to crawl inside the patient's mouth. So we need to be aware and not lay our breasts on the patient's forehead. Okay, Jonathan? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, is, uh, let's take a look at this. What's it look like? Looks good. Yeah, looks pretty good. All right, arms are parallel. Forearms are parallel, chin down, 
Modified pen grass, fingers are together, back looks straight. When we talk about a grasp falling apart, this is what we're talking about. This is the fulcrum, this person's fulcruming, but there's separation here and separation here, trying to reach. This is not having control of the instrument. Very hard to do. So that's why we spend a lot of time on fulcruming and we're harping on you and we're telling you to sit up and everything else. Now, what, does this look good to you? No. Was that me? Um, um, so anyway, she's got the soft C here, but look at the wrist. That is not neutral position. Okay, let me see where. All right, can you see module six now? Yes. Yay. This is not getting any easier for me. Okay, finger rests in the posterior sextant. Now, hopefully on Monday, you'll get your typodonts as well as your cassettes, but the typodonts are something that you can take home with you and practice your instrumentation with. So we're going to take a look at finger rests with the aspects of teeth towards and away of the posterior teeth. So that is beyond towards the back of your canines. So you need to have an intraoral fulcrum, right? We'll start with the front and then we'll, going to, uh, we'll go to the back. Me, my patient, my equipment, my non-dominant hand, my dominant hand, and my finger rest, right? Nothing's changed. Clinicians with longer fingers can establish a grasp higher on the instrument handle. Normally we have it on the between the shank and the um, and the handle. So it depends on your fingers. Okay, so this is the finger rest here for the posterior and look at where the instrument is. Again, that instrument is not on the handle or not on the tooth being worked on. The grasp can be here or can be a little bit closer depending on the shape of your hand. But notice that the side pad here is on the shank because this is what's giving you that tactile sensitivity. There's vibrations that are being sent up this handle, I'm sorry, this um, shank, and you're going to feel it here. And that's going to tell you uh, what to interpret with what you're feeling because you're not seeing where that blade is. It's underneath the gum tissue. Assume the recommended clock position. So what clock position is this? It's not nine o'clock. It's not 12 o'clock. Nine's over here. Twelve's up here. So that would be at an 11 o'clock, yeah. Position the mirror head in a Frisbee position between the dental arches. I don't know what a Frisbee position is, but I guess this is the Frisbee. You can use the mirror to retract. It's got reflection on both sides. So no matter how you're holding the mirror, you can retract on one side and view on the other side. Now for the anterior area, remember how up and down that uh, handle was? For more of the anterior, the posterior, it's more down on this portion of the green. So 
surfaces away, surfaces towards, okay? So if I'm here, this is towards me, and then this is towards me, so I'm sitting at the nine o'clock position. Blump, blump. So if I'm doing the maxillary buckle and the mandibular buckle on the right side, I can do the maxillary and mandibular lingual on the other side in that same clock position. Surfaces away from me, I need to scoot my um, stool a little bit or my saddle to the 10 or 11 o'clock position. And the patient's head will be towards you. Chin up, chin down. So for the lefty, it's the same thing, just on the opposite side of the clock. Three o'clock and the one or two o'clock position. This is what we're all going to look like, okay? She's sitting in a more of an eight o'clock position because her thighs are together. She's trying to crawl inside the patient's mouth. Does this even look comfortable? Definitely not. And look at her hair in front of her, ew. Okay. Her feet are not flat on the floor. Her pants are a little too tight, okay? But these are the type of socks that's good to have because we're not supposed to see any skin. Her elbows are too high. Does this look anything like a modified pen grasp? No. Nope, not even close. Ms. D? Yeah. I'm trying to still make sense out of the, uh, the 10 o'clock position for the, was it for mandibular, mandibular posterior teeth facing away? I'm, I'm, maybe I just misunderstood that and I tried to quickly look at it in the book and see if that made any more sense to me. It would be maxillary. Was it maxillary? Yeah, yeah, it's all spelled out in the book. So don't, don't uh, Kathy, you're gonna drive yourself nuts trying to, to memorize all this now. Yeah, I, it just didn't make sense to me, and I thought maybe I was misunderstanding something, but I'll look back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't find my sharing now. I have another um, quick question, Ms. D. Um, so when we're going to be tested on all of this, um, are, do we need to know both right and left side positions, or do we just need to know what our position is? You need to know your position. Hopefully, if it's a three o'clock, and if I mess up, and I'm saying for a lefty, then it's going to be the, or, or if I'm saying a nine o'clock, and it's going to be for a lefty, if I mess up and don't have it listed, it's going to be the three o'clock. It's just the opposite. Okay. Okay, I, I should have it. I tried, I try and be good, but you can see how messed up I am. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I got a question. I am looking in the Garrick book and it says for a right-handed clinician, the mandibular posterior teeth away from the clinician is at 10 o'clock. Okay. That seems counterintuitive because if you're, maybe not, maybe well, just. You know what, what we're going to do is we're going to get in the uh, chairs and we're going to play with it. Miss D. Hello? Yes. Sorry. Um, so I know you said that we're having the skilly valve next Monday on um, like the mouth mirrors, mm -hmm. but I don't think we went over that last lab. We did it. Um, we um, autoclaved them, so we haven't actually used them yet. Okay, well, we will do, uh, we will practice it in the morning and skilly valve in the afternoon. We still have to do the skilly valves for vital signs too, and most of, um, at least me, I didn't practice that yet because we didn't have time last time. Well, vital signs, we, you haven't had any of the, um, you don't have your blood pressure cuff, so we're ignoring vital signs for now. If I can scrounge up blood pressure cuffs, we can practice a little bit more. 
but you all ideally were supposed to have your blood pressure cuff so you could be practicing on anybody and everybody that was coming through your house. Okay, thank you. That was, that was the intent of it. Okay, I can't figure out how to get a new screen share. Um, Miss e. Oh, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay, so I just have a quick uh, clarify for the test on on the canvas. I see that on the exam three, you put chapter four, six, and twelve, and chapter twelve should be on the next exam. Don't exam. don't look don't look at any of those because all I did was just update. Those were from last year and a different. Um, so basically, you will let us know what oh, chapter. Oh, absolutely, because the chapter numbers have changed as well from last year's book. Oh, okay. So all I did was copy that and bring it over. Oh, gotcha. And you also gave us the uh, the gearing book to read as well for the um, future exam or something like that. You will let us know ahead? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, Tuesday is chapters 8, 10, 11, and 12, and modules 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, oh, yeah, you're talking about exam two. Exam number two. That's okay. all you need to worry about for now. Okay, okay. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be looking too far ahead. I just bring that. <laughs> all you do is panic. <laughs> yes, I, I was. <laughs> okay. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about direct vision and indirect vision. All right, direct vision, you're using your eyes. Anytime you can use direct vision, it's better, but sometimes you need to use a mouth mirror for indirect vision. And indirect vision helps you keep your ergonomics and uh, allow you to see through the mirror instead of bending yourself to accommodate. So you've got these handles and hopefully you, you'll have a pen or pencil in your hand, okay? But uh, practicing the modified pen grass, but take a look at that green shaded area again. That's where the handle for the maxillary posterior can, can be. You've got lots of wiggle room there. I think we've done this already. Clock positions for surfaces towards me for the posterior, nine o'clock for the right-handed, three o'clock for the lefty. Surfaces away, 10 or 11 o'clock for the right-handed, one or two o'clock for the lefty. And then you've got some exercises that you can do here that is recommended that you do in between each of your patients. And Anne Guillaume, who's speaking on Friday, is an ergonomic specialist, and she spends a lot of her lecture time going over this and the importance of it. So your equipment, me, my patient, my equipment, she's reaching way too far. This equipment should be very close to her. She's not sitting all the way back and her back is hunched. Ms. D, did you say you were going to post these after lecture today? Yeah, you just got to find them. Okay. Okay. I think modules 7 through 12 are posted, just not 5 and 6. Just not 5 and 6. Thanks, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's you. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, technique essentials. So we're just going through um, instrumentation. What is instrumentation? Okay, these are your fine motor skills. Your big motor skills were the me, my patient, my equipment. Those are the big motor skills. Now we want to go into some of the fine motor skills. Okay, they involve small movements. Psychomotor skills require complex movements and repeated practice. And I can't emphasize this enough, the repeated practice. We have the misfortune of only having clinic on one day. If you learn a skill and practice it on a Monday and don't practice it throughout the week, you're not going to have that skill down by the next Monday. So we want you to have your type of dance at home and we want you to be practicing. Think about how, it, how long it took you to learn to ride a bike or to uh, learn how to swim or to drive a car. It doesn't happen overnight. And when you first start something, you have to think of every little step involved versus eventually now when we're driving, we're ending up from one end of the county to the other and we've been listening to music or talking on the phone and we don't even know we weren't paying attention but we got there thank goodness okay because it's all muscle memory so you have to practice okay observing imitating practicing 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 and then adapting so mental attention to the steps of psychomotor skills needs to be made and you need to be learned all of this during your preclinical instrumentation sessions. You need to practice. The, the more prepared you are when you come into clinic with having reviewed this at least, and it's not brand new information, the quicker you will pick it up. Imitating, copying the psychomotor skill. We're demonstrating. You're trying to imitate it. The learner attempts to follow each step. The steps are all listed in the book. The movements aren't smooth. They're not automatic yet, but we're there. We're going to be giving you feedback. Your partner will be giving you feedback as well. You're going to practice and practice and practice, and then the movements become smoother. And finally, you've got it, okay? Practice, practice, practice. Psychomotor skills in the brain. Muscle memory, frequently enacted muscle tasks that are stored in the brain. And with practice, these movements become smoother. And it actually is a physiological change as myelination occurs. I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but myelinization is the process of forming a myelin sheath around a nerve to allow nerve impulses to move more quickly. Okay, you're learning the dance. It's going to be coming better and faster. So evidence suggests repeated practice of fine motor skills really creates a denser myelin matter. So the quality of practice is important as the learner, which is you, needs to repeat and improve movements toward perfection. And we are all type A personalities and we want to be perfect. So automasticity, okay, is the ability to perform a psychomotor skill smoothly, easily, and without frustration. This does not come easily, this without frustration. We use automacity every day. Like we said, driving a car. We're not thinking about what we're doing. We're on automatic pilot. So what are some of the strategies for psychomotor learning? We've got guidance, and that is step-by-step -step instructions. And that's what's so good about the Gehrig textbook. Have it in clinic with you. Practice, okay, and get feedback. And that's what the instructors are going to be doing, walking around. Feedback, okay. Use it. Recognition of self-assessment. You want to recognize incorrect technique and assess performance. So that's why we say every now and then just freeze frame it yourself. What does your hand look like? What does it look like compared to the book? What do you need to do to make it look like the book? And then you practice beyond getting it right. You practice, 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 and eventually it's just going to be part of your being. So we've got different activations of the um, instrument. Moving, motion activation is the muscle action 
used to move the working end of the instrument across the tooth surface. So you've got a scaler or an explorer and you want to feel around that whole surface of the tooth. That's motion activation. So during activation, the fulcrum finger, which is your support beam, okay, supports the weight of your hand. The fulcrum assists in controlling the movement and the fulcrum also acts as a break to stop the movement at the end of a stroke so you don't go flying off the tooth, okay? It gives you control. So the fulcrum is a very important finger. It's important to remember that instrument strokes are tiny movements, tiny. You're staying underneath the gum tissue, tiny movements. And the working end of the instrument is only a few millimeters of movement with each stroke, tiny. And that's refinement. When you first start, they're going to be big, chunky strokes. Think about somebody who's learning um, a toddler or, you know, a kindergartner learning how to hold a pencil and they've got these big, chunky pencils. And, and as their fine motor skills develop, they can go into a thinner pencil. So there's two types of movement. We've got wrist rocking movement and digital activation wrist rocking motion, the hand, wrist, and arm work as a unit to produce a rotating motion used to move the working end of the instrument. Okay, and this is important. Everything works as a unit. There's less fatigue that using wrist rocking than finger movement, and the motion is similar to turning a knob, a doorknob. So when we're talking about wrist rocking, okay, we've got the doorknob. That's what we're doing, okay? The doorknob. Rocking and rolling. The wrist rocking. Okay, but you're doing it on your fulcrum. You're using your whole shoulder and elbow and arm. You're not just using your wrist. And this is how you practice. We are using this motion to remove calculus. It allows the clinician, you, to maintain a neutral position. It keeps the workload of our forearm and our wrists, okay, it, it's balancing the forearm instead of us using our fingers and our wrists, and the fulcrum supports the weight of the hand. So our shoulder is activated here. We're using our entire upper shoulder and arm and wrist as a unit and not using our fingers. Is this making sense? So digital motion activation is moving the instrument by flexing the thumb and the index fingers. Okay. It's used whenever physical strength is not required. And you move the instrument by making push-pull movements with the fingers. This is finger motion. This is everything working as a unit. We can use digital motion in a couple areas ultrasonic instrumentation, okay, using power instruments, okay, uh, using periodontal probes, assessment instruments, as well as explorers. Now, the problem with this is that we, your first instruments you're going to use, you're going to be able to use some finger motion, and then we're going to put a scaler in your hand, and we're going to start smacking you that you're not allowed to use fingers anymore. I recommend, and this is how I was taught, even for um, assessment instruments, we learned not to use our fingers because that way we didn't have any habit to break when we were um, needing to go on to our hand instruments for scalers. It's not recommended for calculus removal with uh, hand instruments. Uh, you might need to use it for restricted areas. So we're talking body coordination, motion activation, wrist rocking, activation and digital motion activation, which is just for assessment instruments. 
So let's, that was the rocking. Let's talk about rolling, it's the rock and the roll. Rolling the instrument handle is turning the handle between the thumb and the finger, index finger. Let me get the picture off, okay. The purpose of rolling the handle helps maintain precise contact within that pocket area, because again, you're working underneath the gum tissue. Then you've got something called a drive finger, and that's either the index finger or the thumb, which determines the direction in which the working end is going to turn. So if you've got your pencil in your hand or your pen in your hand and you roll it between your fingers, that's, those are your drive fingers. Is it rolling away from you? Or is it rolling towards you? And this is using a pen to do that. Is it rolling away from you or is it rolling towards you? And pivoting is the slight swinging motion of the hand or arm and arm carried out by balancing on the fulcrum. So you're pivoting in tiny movements that's used to reposition the hand and the pivot supports an object as it turns or rotates. So you've got a bunch of these little fine motor skills. You're rocking, you're rolling, you're pivoting um, all at the same time. So pivoting assists the clinician in maintaining adaptation as the working end moves towards the tooth. Pivoting is used principally when moving around a line angle onto a proximal surface. Line angle, oh my gosh, we discussed that last week in oral anatomy, where two lines meet. So where you go from the distal and come around to the buckle, that is the distal buckle line angle, you have a corner that you have to turn, and that is using your pivoting. So you're pivoting to get around these corners. You're rolling the instrument to help maintain contact of the working end, and you're pivoting on your fulcrum finger. A little bit about angulation. The placement of the working end in relation to the tooth surface being instrumented is critical. The correct visual picture of true angulation of the teeth in the dental arches assists the correct placement of the working ends on the root surfaces. So what you have to do is picture this long axis of the tooth. Okay, again, we were going over this in oral anatomy. Most teeth aren't positioned directly up and down, but they're tilted in the dental arch. And we have things that we're looking at, the shank of the instrument, for example, that needs to be parallel to the long axis of the tooth. So is this parallel? Okay, this is true angulation versus this is what we think it is. Okay, it's really angled. The maxillary roots incline inward. So you have to visualize what that root surface is looking like underneath the gum tissue and underneath bone. You have to visualize what the tooth looks like because this is going to be covered with gum and bone. If this was your instrument, guess what? You're scaling air and you're injuring the gingiva. So you wanna stay on the tooth. So each tooth has a lot of surfaces, each with its own orientation or plane. So orientations of the crown surface differ from orientations of the root surface because the crowns of the teeth are gonna be shaped differently than the roots of the teeth. So look at all the differences here between the crown and the root. This is what we're looking at on your instrument here, because this is the long axis of the tooth, parallel to the long axis. This is parallel, but it's not on the tooth. So again, you need to visualize what that tooth looks like underneath the gum and underneath the bone. Buccal and lingual and mesial and distal.
So when we're always talking about parallel to the long axis of the tooth, this is what we're talking about. And when we're talking about having the tip third or the um, toe third on the tooth at all times, this is where the instrument needs to be with the green and not the red. So this is the mesial surface of tooth here, okay, central incisor. It's, this probe is not going straight up and down, but you can see where the probe is angled, okay, like the root is. You want the probe angled, staying on the tooth at all times. Have I lost you all? No, I think I'm definitely wishing I had my Typodon to practice on. I know. Yeah. Oh, Miss, um, Miss D, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I lost my brand. <laughs> So um, like you mentioned earlier that we don't need to memorize those things. So we will look at that again when we have the clinic time. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So yeah. just look through that and uh, practice that at home. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, have I, are you all spent? Do you want to do some more? Or do you want to call it a day? We've got two chapters to still go over, which I'm happy to do. Uh, we've got chapters uh, five and six today, and we're going to go over chapter five again next time. So let's do maybe clinical procedures, chapter six. Are you okay with that? Yes. Is that for the world? That's, we're going back to Wilkins, yeah. Oh, okay, Wilkins. Okay, so let's take a five-minute break, guys. Just stand up and, and get uh, some circulation going and let me get uh, my, my chapter out because I'm all lost. Come back in five minutes. <laughs> 